Hey yo, from the haunted kingdom of Ohio, you are listening to O Culture. I am your host, Ryan Peverly. My conversation with Tracy Rowan is coming up in just a few moments. If you want to skip right to it, click open the show notes to see the timestamp when the interview begins. We're talking the patron folk saint of death herself, Santa Muerte, as well as some Aztec and Mexican folklore, Catholic occultism, the divine feminine, and much, much more. But first, welcome to Trap or Treat 2. Oh, <laughs> 
Hey yo again from the haunted kingdom of Ohio. I am Ryan Peverly, your Halloween party host, the patron saint of thy holy trap music. You're listening to Oculture's presentation of Trap or Treat 2. Hashtag Trap or Treat 2 if you're following the show on Twitter or Instagram. This is the first part in a month-long thematic series that leads up to Halloween, my favorite time of the year. And what better way to start this series than with death herself? And who better to talk to us about that than Tracy Rollin? Tracy is the author of the new book, Santa Muerte, The History, Rituals, and Magic of Our Lady of the Holy Death, just released this week by Red Wheel Weiser, one of the preeminent publishers of occult and esoteric literature. So let's do this damn thing already and cast this pod off into the netherworld where Our Lady of the Holy Death awaits us with her skeletal smile and a pint of tequila. Enjoy! <laughs> Tracy Rollin, thanks so much for being on the show. Hi, thank you for inviting me. Yeah, no problem. I should tell you that I'm sort of familiar with Mexican folk magic and Catholic saints, and, and these sorts of things are, are really the, the meat of what you're writing about here in your new book. Uh, it's called Santa Muerte, The History, Rituals, and Magic of Our Lady of the Holy Death. So I think the best place to start is with the author. You know, I'm really interested in the personal story and, and how you got to be in the position that you're in now, you know, writing about Mexican folk saints. So take me back to your childhood, your youth, and, and tell the listeners how you got interested in magic or this magical world that you've discovered. Where did that interest come from? Well, I was born and raised in New Mexico. As a matter of fact, I was born in Albuquerque. Um, my father is an adoptee from Chicago. My mother is a German national. She was born in Bavaria, and uh, she was a very devout Catholic. When I was a little girl, I went to Catholic church quite a bit. It was more than just a once-a-week affair. Sometimes we'd even go three times a week. Uh, the busier Catholic church has actually run mass uh, out here seven times a week, and during Holy Weeks, we'd even go seven times a day right before school. The prayer and dealing with saints in particular, as opposed to just, you know, dealing with the Holy Trinity, came to become a big deal in my family around about time I was the age of seven. Uh, we experienced a personal family tragedy. Um, one of my uh, siblings, my brother, uh, wound up going to prison for committing a violent crime and spent 20 years of his life there. And uh, during the trial period, we were, or more accurately, my mother was, I was only seven years old at the time, so I wasn't really able to direct activities um, was very dedicated to praying to St. Jude, the patron saint of lost causes, to try to rectify my brother's situation. Unfortunately, it didn't work very well since he did spend 20 years, but when I was a little girl, some of my earliest memories were always going to church, always going to like the back naves of the Catholic Church where you always have the special shrine set up to, oh, whatever saint, St. Bernadette, St. Matthew, St. Christopher, St. what have you. And uh, having to pray to saints very, very frequently. Now, another component of a Catholic upbringing, especially devout Catholic upbringing, is you will go to uh, something called catechism once a week. It is a specialized doctrine of education. It's religious school. It's kind of like Sunday school, although honestly, I usually went on Wednesdays. And uh, what it was supposed to prepare you for was Catholic religious life, like how you're going to do your first confession. How do you do communion? How do you do things like that? And one of the things that was a major, major focus of catechism was a lot of Catholic folk saints, or a lot of, not, not folk saints, just a lot of regular Catholic saints were focused on quite a bit. Um, I had all these little, like, uh, there are things called novena cards. They are little uh, painted saints cards. I'll have a picture of the saint on the front and a prayer on them uh, written on the back. The nuns that used to teach catechism handed out these cards like like nothing. I had so many of them, my father actually referred to them as Catholic baseball cards, if that gives you an idea. Mm -hmm, yeah. So being trained to you know, worship saints and venerate saints and look to saints for help was just something that you just did. It was what you did. I grew away from the Catholic Church in my... Um, well, I started growing away from the Catholic Church when I was about 9 or 10, honestly. I, I really, really, really wanted to be a Catholic priest. And then I found out I couldn't be one. And I started looking into why I couldn't be one. And that starts... Causing a lot of doubts, you might say, in the way that you start thinking. You start looking at other modes of religious thought. You start looking at simply other religions. Then you start looking at things that Catholics say you shouldn't be looking at, such as witchcraft. And, well, ideas are ideas, and some just wound up being more attractive than others. 
So is the official reason that you couldn't be a priest because you're a woman? That is 100% correct. A woman in the Catholic Church cannot become a priest. It was only, I think, in the past three or four years. I mean, very recently. that The Catholic Church is allowing them to uh, work sometimes as deacons. Okay, so kind of like a low-level... I hate to say a priest because they haven't actually taken priestly vows, but they can do... They can, like... uh, They can't perform sacraments like a baptism, but they might be able to do things like bless holy water. Right. So, so, which really isn't being a priest. In my opinion. Say, yeah, that's, so that's really not it. anything. So how did your Catholic upbringing then sort of prepare you for your magical practice? That's part of you now. One thing that some a lot of folks don't realize about Catholics is Catholics actually, actually practice a lot of folk magic themselves. I remember when I was a little girl, uh, one of the things I was taught to say by the nuns of all people Whenever I lost anything, say I lost my schoolwork, I lost my house key, whatever it was, I would go find myself a St. Anthony statue. St. Anthony is the patron saint of things that are lost. And I was supposed to go find a St. Anthony statue or his Novena card. I had so many of them. And say, St. Anthony, St. Anthony, bring back my car keys, whatever. Well, not my car keys, my house key at the time. And uh, within a few minutes, normally, you would suddenly trip over or stumble over whatever it is that you'd lost. Or that was the idea anyway. As a matter of fact, St. Anthony statues, if you go over to like a Catholic supply store, they often are carrying and cradling a baby Jesus. That baby Jesus is often designed to be removable. The reason why it's removable on a St. Anthony statue and not any other kind of statue where you happen to see a saint holding the baby Jesus is because you're supposed to steal his Jesus away if he doesn't bring your stuff back. Seriously. If Hmm. St. Anthony doesn't bring your things back to you, you take his little plastic baby Jesus from him and hide it until he does. (laughs) Now, if that's not witchcraft, I don't know what is. Yeah. Of course, Catholics won't tell you it's witchcraft, but there you have it. Well, I've been reading a lot recently about the occult roots of Roman Catholicism. Do you know anything mm-hmm. about that? Absolutely. The Roman Catholic Church has a lot of myths and traditions that have been incorporated from or built upon earlier religions. Uh, One of the ones that people love to bring up is the uh, birth of Jesus Christ, for example. Um, It's supposed to be in the uh, December time frame, according to uh, religious tradition. You know, that's why Christmas is in December. And yet, if you read the uh, uh, passages about his birth, there's, you know, a lot of lambs being born. And lambs aren't born in the middle of winter. So, lambs are born in the spring. So, a lot of people think that the birth of Christ was actually moved to the Christmas time frame to coincide with the Roman holiday, holiday of Saturnalia. And, of course, you know, Saturnalia being a major Roman holiday, it's a way of bringing people into the fold. You could still do something on, you know, December 24th, you just have to worship a different god. Which, I suppose, is a sales pitch, apparently a working one. <laughs> yeah. So, um, the Catholic Church itself, a lot of people uh, seem to believe that the Catholic Church... Uh, rooted out and destroyed all occult tradition, or that they were 100% against magic and witchcraft and occult things, especially like in the medieval and early Renaissance era. You always hear about, say, like the burning times, for example, you know, killing witches and all this sort of thing. And I'm not saying that that didn't happen. It did. It did. But the Catholic Church was also supportive of occult knowledge and bodies of occult knowledge, so long as it wasn't, shall we say, antithetical to the Church's aims. Several books on uh, magic and occultism uh, were actually written by Catholic priests. And one of the things you find most interesting is, one question I am often asked is, if this is a Mexican folk tradition or an indigenous religious tradition, uh, the veneration of Santa Muerte, why does it have such Euro-pagan overtones, okay? Mm -hmm. And the reason why that is, is... The Catholic priests, the Italian priests that came along with the Spanish, you know, to convert the locals, practiced their own forms of mysticism. It's just, it wasn't the kind that the locals practiced. There's this interesting book called Witchcraft in the Southwest, Spanish and Indian Supernaturalism on the Rio Grande, written by a man named Mark Simmons, who outlines this very well. He talks about the evolution of of witchcraft and uh, witchcraft thinking in uh, Mexico and, of course, the Southwest. Southwestern United States, when before the Spanish arrived and before the Catholic priests arrived, when something bad would happen in a native community, say that there was a plague, for example, normally some uh, person would be scapegoated out as, you know, the cause of the plague. You know, in Europe, you might think of that old lady at the end of the village who no one knows and has 50 cats, clearly the witch, it's her fault. 
Well, in native culture, they may have their own version of the old lady who lives alone at the end of the village with the 50 cats. See? So then the shaman would go, and he'd have to go and cleanse and purify her. Sometimes they would even go, and I'm talking the natives themselves, would go as far as to burn her, burn, uh, bury her alive. I mean, literally torture and kill this person to death because they thought they were the source of the trouble and the plague and all the misery. So when the Spanish show up and they see the Indians practicing their native style beliefs, you know, like they're calling upon their native spirits, you know, to get rid of plagues or, you know, trying to get, you know, good harvests or what have you. It wasn't that they were calling on native spirits. to. It wasn't that they were doing, you know, rituals trying to get rain. It was the fact that they were calling on native spirits. So when the Catholic priests rolled in, they simply stopped having them call on native spirits and started having them call on Jesus. So... A lot of the shenanigans that happened that you would think of, um, like people still being accused of witchcraft or what have you, still happened under Spanish rule. And folk beliefs in how to deal with spirits and how to deal with bad people, you know, like uh, wearing maybe your shirt inside out or um, throwing salt across your uh, folk uh, across your doorstep or any of these kinds of folk magic type things, were 100% supported by the Catholics. They did it themselves. Hmm. Yeah, definitely. And you mentioned the Euro-pagan roots of Santa Muerte. There was yes. an interesting anecdote in your book, too, that really jived with me because I've been researching a lot recently about the Crusades. I've been writing this thing about the Knights of Malta, and mm-hmm. you know that's one of the original Catholic military orders. And you mentioned in your book that during the Crusades, a number of magical and alchemical texts were brought to Europe from Arabia, you know, the, this land that they were just crusading through and conquering. Absolutely. Do you have any idea what sort of texts those may have been and where they may have wound up after that? Where they may have wound up, uh, you can find or hear about varieties of some of these books being held in old libraries in uh, universities, a lot of them in Europe. One of the books that was uh, brought back and compiled back together was something called the Corpus Hermeticum. The other thing was called, oh, it's uh, slipping my mind at the moment. Was it the Picatrix or not? The Picatrix, yes, absolutely. Thank you so much. The Picatrix specifically is a very, very interesting book. Um, Anyone who is interested in the roots of ceremonial magic, especially reading any kind of medieval or Renaissance grimoire, would be well served by finding a copy of the Picatrix. You can get it on Amazon. It actually comes in two books. What it is, is it is truly a textbook of astrology and magical talisman making and all sorts of things that are related to those kinds of concepts. Okay, all the seals, all the symbols, and it's all laid out very, very clearly. I mean, it's it's literally textbook fashion. It's very thick. And it is also one of the earliest books that was brought over. Again, it was brought over from the Crusades. Where did all of this knowledge come from? Well, all this lore was, you think of ancient lore, you know, something that the ancient Romans thought or the ancient Greeks knew or the ancient Egyptians did. A lot of that got scattered and destroyed at the end of the, at the end of the Roman Empire. And a lot of these scholars wound up taking their works and having to move eastwards into what would be the, you know, the Byzantine Empire then in order to preserve their works. Now we're talking about ninth, 10th century or so. So of course, when the Knights Templar come rolling through in multiple crusades, or the knights in general uh, come rolling through in multiple crusades. They wind up bringing these books back with them, which had all been compiled, because all of these scholars, which had previously been disparate and scattered all across all points of the Roman Empire, all went to one place when the Roman Empire collapsed, which made books like the Picatrix possible. So when it comes back to Europe, and it gets in the hands of the Christian priests, they look at it, and it's good magic. It is solid magic. In terms of ideology, if you read about, you know, what it is all about, the preamble for the book. It is written by a Muslim scholar, so it's, you know, praise Allah and, you know, peace be unto others and all this kind of thing, which was not unusual and not unadaptable by the Christian priests. So they go ahead and they bring in this body of knowledge. And now when you look at any of the uh, later on grimoires that you may see, I'm talking about anything, the Keys of Solomon, for example, you will see its roots back in the Picatrix, which were brought back from the Crusades, which were in originally in the Middle East, which were brought to the Middle East by the collapse of Rome. Yeah, so I'm wondering too, you know, if nowadays I think we would see crusades as more like modern warfare, right? Where we're trying to conquer all these different countries. Not we, not me and you, but, you know, Mm -hmm. the standing armies of where we live, I guess. Us, generically. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. The royal we, I suppose, right? Mm Mm-hmm. And there's always an ulterior motive for those sorts of crusades, you know, whether it's oil or banking or whatever. And I'm wondering, going back, 
to the crusades that we know of that we're talking about here if maybe this occult and esoteric knowledge in these books wasn't a reason for crusading through there because the roots of alchemy seem to go back to islam or to ancient egypt at at least and i'm just wondering if you see any connection there like maybe on the surface it's oh yeah we have to spread christianity but maybe beneath that it's like well we also want this knowledge that your cultures have well the etymology of the word alchemy actually comes from the greek alchemia which means to fuse or cast and the etymology of the word kumia itself is thought to go back to the word chem which means black which was the egyptians word for their own land which they called kemet the black land because of the constant flooding of the nile so the fact that those kinds of ideas were around and old enough to be in the Picatrix, because some people think of alchemy as strictly a more medieval or even a Renaissance kind of art, and it's actually much, much older, much, much older, as you know. One other goal of alchemy is, oh, people always think, oh, alchemy is you're going to turn lead into gold, lead into gold, eternal riches, eternal riches, right? And that's actually a metaphor for changing a base substance, i.e. the human self, the ordinary human who is unenlightened and not wise and not full and knowing it of his own personal ways, and turning them into a more divine, in a sense, more Christ-like figure is oftentimes an analogy that you'll see. Sometimes the metal of gold is is uh, used as an analogy for Christ himself because it's supposed to be pure and perfect and all that. Right. So I don't know if the initial crusading knights went there to discover, and for the purpose of discovering these magical texts. I honestly think, they're, think that they just went there for dealing with historical incursions from the uh, from the Muslims at the time, and also wanting to get their own land back. I mean, they went straight for Jerusalem, after all. Yeah. So, But once they discovered the, um, the knowledge, that's a whole different thing entirely. I, if I, I would believe the Crusading Knights would have found a gem far more uh, valuable than mere treasure in that kind of thing. Some of the ideas that were brought back into Europe did not sit well with the Pope, as I'm sure you've uh, known or read about, for example, the uh, Gnostic heresy in the 12th century, I'm sorry, the 12th century? Was it 12th century? I believe so. Um, do you know the origins of the Catholic rosary? No, I don't, but I'd love to hear it. All right. So the word rosary means rosarium. Okay. It refers to wreath of roses. Catholics have been using beads to count prayers since basically time out of mind. There's a lot of uh, instances, stories about 3rd, 4th century wandering. Uh, they were Catholic at the time because the only thing you could be was Catholic. It was the only Christian tradition in the 3rd or 4th century. They would keep track of uh, saying the Our Father prayer or the Pater Noster by keeping little uh, pebbles in little pouches. Okay, And, of course, since pebbles and pouches have a tendency to get lost, they wound up stringing them along on um, beaded strands. And you wind up having these rosaries. Now, why it's specifically called a rosary, the etymology of the word bead in English is actually prayer, if you if you know. So to say your beads is to actually say your prayers, if you look at the etymology. Back in the 10th century, there was a lady named Lady Godiva. This is the same famous Lady Godiva who, uh, protesting taxes that her husband was raising against, against his peasants, against his subjects, decided to ride buck buki naked through town wearing only her hair as clothing. That Lady Godiva, yeah. she was a great devotee of the Virgin Mary and actually credits the Virgin Mary with giving her the chutzpah to actually ride naked through town and force, his husband, force her husband to lower the taxes. And when she died, she had these. She had a set of prayer beads. And, uh, of course, they were fabulously jeweled. This lady, I mean, she was very, very rich, a noble woman. And uh, she dedicated them to the local uh, Catholic church so that, so that they would uh, adorn the statue of the Virgin Mary like a wreath of roses specifically, because they often draped wreaths of roses around the statue of Virgin Mary. So that's how the our beads wound up becoming, prayer beads wound up becoming rosariums, because they were just like these wreaths of roses. And so you have this rosary. So getting back to my original story about heresies and crusades, so back in France, uh, they kind of got a hold of this idea that perhaps the uh, world that the God had put together wasn't exact, exactly perfect, because the God that put it together perhaps wasn't a very nice guy. That God was perhaps tyrannical, that God was perhaps rather like a child who didn't care about smashing an anthill in some senses, that kind of rationale. And of course, this doesn't sit very well with the Catholic Church, because God is great, and God is love, and God is perfect and caring and kind and wise. So the Catholic Church winds up declaring war on these guys. It was uh, 
um, the Cathar heresy back in the 12th century, if I remember correctly. Mm -hmm. So the reason why Catholics go and actually pray the rosary is at the time there was a Catholic saint who wound up becoming the founder of the Inquisition, actually, his order. And he decided to go and go into the woods because he was praying to the uh, Cathars and trying to get them to convert away from this heresy that God was a terrible, tyrannical figure. And he was utterly failing at doing so. And on the military side of things, um, the Pope had sent in troops to deal with these returning knights who were, of course, uh, very rich now because they plundered the Middle East and very experienced military force. And uh, frankly, the Vatican was losing. So the saint goes off into the woods and he starts praying, you know, dear God, dear Virgin Mary, what do I do? What do I do? And according to tradition, the Virgin Mary appeared to him and said, if you teach them to say the Ave Maria 150 times on a rosary and you spread my Ave Maria, I will personally rescue the Vatican and I will personally end this heresy. And the saint was like, really? And she's like, oh, yes. So he takes his rosary and he starts getting people to start saying these Ave Marias over and over and over again. And again, according to Catholic tradition, the luck of the Vatican forces suddenly changed. It was like they'd have incredible luck, you know, catching people, you know, uh, like unawares, or like a camp that didn't know that they were going to come over the hill with all their troops. They would be able to fight, you know, 10 men to one, all this sort of thing. The uh, crushing of that particular heresy is, according to Catholic tradition, actually credited to the Virgin Mary. Hmm. That's an interesting story. I've never heard that before. So that's actually, uh, I think, a, a good segue into Santa Muerte because for all intents and purposes, she is an emanation of the Virgin Mary, right? Some people do consider her to be an emanation of the Virgin Mary. It's a very interesting logic, and I actually sort of like how it works. So if you look at Catholic tradition typically, or Christian tradition in general, you go back to the book of Genesis. You have Eve who turns around, she finds this tree of knowledge, and she talks to the serpent, and the serpent says, eat the apple, it's tasty, you'll learn everything. She eats it, and now we're all kicked out of the Garden of Eden. Women must uh, suffer childbearing and pain and all this kind of thing. That's the basic story in Genesis. So a lot of people say that this isn't exactly fair, that we should all be punished for the behavior of Eve, because we weren't there, certainly. So the rationale then comes that the Virgin Mary becomes the new Eve, all right, by accepting her son, the salvation, and he goes and dies for the sin of all the world uh, up on his cross on, during the crucifixion. Uh, we are all absolved of sin, Eve's original sin, and therefore we can all go to heaven, all's forgiven. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, that is sometimes why you see images of the Virgin Mary uh, holding an apple alongside the baby Jesus, because the apple then becomes a symbol of salvation instead of a symbol of failure or disobedience to God. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. So also according to tradition, so Christ goes ahead and gets crucified on the uh, hill of Golgotha with uh, two thieves alongside him. And uh, his mother, of course, is there, and she's weeping and wailing at his feet. And he dies, and he has to have his body prepared. Well, his mother is one of the three Marys, the three women named Mary, who go and prepare his body and embalm him and all that kind of thing. And again, according to tradition, three days later, he disappears. He rises out of the grave. You know, the women show up to go check it out. There's an angel sitting there saying, he took off, ladies, sorry, God has risen. And that is Easter, basically. The Virgin Mary obviously saw her own child into the world. I mean, she gave birth to him. And she also tragically saw her own child out of the world, okay, giving birth to him in a sense by embalming his body and giving him the opportunity to resurrect and become the full God-man that he was. So you can interpret the Virgin Mary as a figure that is both the mother of life and by extension a figure who is the mother of death. Now, where we get Santa Muerte kind of comes into this is there are... You, if you read books about Mexican history and Mexican culture, you'll often hear one thing cited, that three things are the pillars of Mexican society. First is Benito Juarez, who is a great uh, revolutionary hero of theirs. Second is the Virgin of Guadalupe. And third is the force or power of death. The reason why the Virgin of Guadalupe is so important, so important, well, let me just tell you the story of her real quick. Uh, so the Spanish go and take over the Valley of Mexico, and they uh, conquer the Aztec Empire in the early 1520s. And not long afterwards, there is an uh, Aztec peasant, his name is Juan Diego, and he's wandering over this hill, just doing his job, doing his daily routine, right? And one day he sees this beautiful woman, a native-looking princess, okay, so she looked like an Aztec princess, you know, native dress, that kind of thing, very gorgeous, shows up, just appears, and says, hey, I want you to build me a great big temple here on this hill. 
And the guy freaks out and he's like, who are you? And she says, oh, I'm the Virgin Mary. And he's like, right. And he runs away and he runs and he goes and he finds the bishop. And he says to the bishop, I just saw this lady appear on this hill and she said she was a Virgin Mary. And the bishop is like, you were totally imagining things, man. You didn't see anything. Don't worry about it. So this guy, every time he goes over the hill, this lady keeps on appearing and saying, build me a temple here. Build me a temple here. So he gets freaked out and he stops going over the hill. All right. Like anybody would. So a couple days later, one of his good, good, good friends gets deathly, deathly ill. And he wants to go visit him before his friend dies. So unfortunately, the way over to his friend's house is over this same hill. So with trepidation, Juan Diego, he goes up this hill, gets up to the top, and this lady appears again. And she's like, where's my temple at? And he's like, no one believes me. My friend is dying. I don't know what's going on, lady. What am I supposed to do? And she says, take all of these flowers and take them to the bishop. Gather them up in your cloak. And he's like, what flowers? She waves her hand. And suddenly, in the middle of January, the entire hillside is covered in roses. So this peasant is now totally freaked out. He goes and he cuts some of these roses real quick, throws them in his cloak, and he races to go find the bishop. And he says, you wouldn't believe it. This lady just showed up again. And she told me to bring you these flowers. So bishop says, let me see. Juan Diego unrolls his cloak. And somehow during transit from him running down the hill and going all the way over to the bishop's place, the image of the Virgin of Guadalupe, the iconic image, you know, the lady in the blue cloak with the pink dress, you know, where she's praying. Yeah. Yeah. had painted itself on the inside of the cloak. And the Virgin Mary, of course, always has flowers at her feet. So, of course, when he unrolls the cloak, the flowers fall at her feet. The image is there. It's perfect. And just then, this guy walks in and says, Hey, Juan Diego's friend who was dying, you don't have to pre- uh, prepare a funeral mass. He's been miraculously healed. The bishop freaks out, declares that he has now just seen two miracles within five minutes, and says, We're going to build a temple over here. And that is how we get the Basilica of Our Lady of Guadalupe, Mexico City. Now, there's two very interesting things about that basilica. Number one, it is built directly on top of the ruins of a temple to the Aztec Great Mother Goddess, Tenancin. Aztec Great Mother Goddess, Tenancin, was a beautiful native-looking princess who also, like the Virgin of Guadalupe, wears a blue cloak of stars, who is always symbolized as pregnant, the Aztec uh, symbol for uh, pregnancy that you'd see in art is a black cord around her waist, just like the Virgin of Guadalupe is wearing. She's got a Nahi Hualan, which is an Aztec symbol for the center of the universe, right over her belly. You could very easily interpret the Aztec symbol, or the Virgin of Guadalupe, as the Aztec image of Tenancin. So it's a very interesting story, and some people will point to the idea that the Virgin Mary, and or or more accurately the Virgin of Guadalupe, and Tenancin may in fact be the same figure. So going back to that idea, where does Santa Muerte come into this? Well, we've already seen that the Virgin Mary that is already in a sense a mother of death because she saw that her own son Jesus out of out of life because she put him in the tomb so he could rise again. The Aztec culture was very, very focused on the idea of balance. And when you were born, your life already started in the negative balance. Okay, we have to eat. We have to, you know, build things. We have to take things from the earth. We are always constantly taking okay we're always owing the earth things okay so the idea behind sacrifice was that you're giving back to the earth and giving back to the spirits who had spent all their time giving you life it's actually a very logical kind of setup okay but that's why they were so focused on the idea of sacrifice so because of this balance uh that had to exist between the power of life and the power of death they also had an aztec death goddess who was very 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 powerful who also was a mother in death to all living. Her name was Mictecasi Huatl, right? She is a goddess of the underworld. She lived at the bottom of the Aztec underworld, nine levels down, in a palace made out of obsidian. And uh, what the idea was is if you were Aztec and you lived and did your life and then you died, you had four years to get down to the bottom of, get down to the bottom of uh, Mictlan, all right, which is, their, which is what they called the underworld. Uh, if you fail to get down there in a four-year time frame, by the way, interestingly, you vaped. You were gone. You would never reincarnate. You were gone forever. All right. So it was a very dangerous journey, okay, full of monsters, demons, jagged rocks, terrible terrain. You get the idea. It was not a picnic going down there. So by the time you actually got down to the bottom of the palace, the goddess would welcome you with open arms, and she would take you into sleep into her stony, cold womb. 
so uh, you could sleep forever. Now, when the age of mankind was uh, supposed to end and everyone had died and everyone who had survived the trip down into Miklon made it back into her cold womb, the next age of man would start again, and she would, in a sense, give birth to all mankind because she'd stored up all of their souls. So just like you have the Virgin Mary going and, in a sense, rebirthing her own son Jesus into eternal life by putting him in the grave, you have this death goddess who goes and rebirths all of humanity after she collects all of their souls back up. See, So you can kind of see the similarity there. So if you have a Catholic church who is pushing uh, the worship and veneration of the Virgin Mary and accepts the form of the Virgin of Guadalupe, it is not really unbelievable to think that the local culture would then latch onto a figure that represented this mother-in-death figure that they already venerated because of Mictacasi Huatl, and was already implied by the Virgin Mary giving birth in a second sense to her son during his resurrection. Does that make sense? Yeah, so absolutely. It, need for the figure exists. So let me take a, just a small tangent here. You said that the the Aztecs had nine levels of the underworld. Does that have any yes. correlation to Dante's nine circles of hell? They actually think that it refers back to uh, nine birth months. It was supposed to be a birth process in reverse. A lot of the symbolism uh, seems to imply literally a birth process in reverse, like the first level of hell has a lot of very, very high jagged mountains into which you go into caves. And the uh, logic is it's almost like a woman's legs and you're looking to go back into the womb. And as it goes deeper and deeper, it gets darker and wetter and then more frightening as you stop seeing tall, jagged mountains and start seeing more unbirthed monsters. And then finally you get to the bottom of Bitlon. So hmm, um, okay. whether Dante's Inferno was also supposed to be nine for the nine months of birth, I don't know. So this is the the major, one of the major components of the Aztec cosmology is this birth, death, and rebirth cycle, right? Is that what we're talking about? Yes, absolutely, absolutely. Okay, so staying on the Aztecs Every one then. of these cycles, oh, uh, they would incidentally refer to as a, as a uh, son of man. So you'd be like on your first son, your second son, your third son, each age of mankind. Um, anyone who's actually really interested in this idea ought to pick up a book called The Fifth Son. It's been out of print. It was, it was printed like in 1982 or 1983, but you can get it easily online or use, you know, used book outlets, you know, like a books or Amazon or what have you. By a guy named uh, Burr Cartwright, right, Cartwright Brundage, B-R-U-N-D-H-E-E. And he gives a fascinating, absolutely fascinating and detailed explanation of Aztec cosmology from soup to nuts. I'll link that in the show notes of this episode for people if they're interested. Mm. So... Staying on the Aztecs for just a moment then, how much of their culture is reflected in what we would call Mexican culture now or general Hispanic culture? You would see a lot of it um, pertaining uh, specifically to Santa Muerte. The Day of the Dead is a major, major, major holiday. A lot of people don't seem to realize the significance of death and funerals in the Mexican culture. There's this great book, another book you ought to link for your listeners, it is called Funerals, Festivals, and Cultural Politics in Porfirian, Mexico, by a guy named uh, Matthew D. Esposito, and it was put out by the University of New Mexico Press, I think, maybe five, six years ago. When I said earlier that you can think of the three pillars of culture as being Benito Juarez, the Virgin of Guadalupe, and death, the Spanish did have a bit of a personal focus on death when they arrived. The reason for this is they were still reeling from the bubonic plague. The European population after the plague didn't really recover its uh, 13th century levels until almost the middle of the 17th century. So a huge portion of the population was decimated. One of the things that the uh, Spanish are thought to maybe have brought over is uh, the idea of a feminized grim reaper that they would refer to as la parca or the parched one. And this kind of, to borrow from uh, Dr. Chesnut, this kind of grim repress kind of figure was brought over with the Spanish and was thought to have been uh, sometimes like the Grim Reaper's wife, a kinder, gentler form of death. And you will see that there are these accounts of peasants in the 16th, 17th, 18th century in Mexico going and addressing skeletal dolls as either La Parca or La Muerte, asking them for favors, giving them presents if they got what they wanted, and beating the dolls or burning them or doing terrible things to them if they didn't get what they wanted. And that kind of thing. So regarding death being a foundational concept in the culture, one way of looking at it is, okay, so Mexico got its independence from Spain, I believe, in 1821. And afterwards, the 
government was extraordinarily unstable. I think like in about a 25 year period, they went through 75 presidents with an average term being eight months. So one guy was president 11 times. They tried two monarchies. The second monarchy, that of Emperor Maximilian, was actually backed by the French, uh, by the French, I believe, Napoleon III. And when that uh, Emperor Maximilian was overthrown, that was actually often referred to as the second Mexican independence. And the chief figurehead in who arranged all that, you know, the grand general, so to speak, was Benito Juarez. That's why he's so important. Okay, not about maybe you know, 10 or 15 years after this happened, he was overthrown by a guy named Porfirio Diaz. Porfirio Diaz implemented basically the most stable government that the entire region had seen in about 75, 80 years. Okay, he ruled for 35 years. Now, keeping that the idea that, you know, Mexican presidency lasted on an average of eight months, that's a monumental, monumental task. The problem is, so this guy, number one, he was incredibly corrupt. He liked to hold, quote unquote, elections, where the only person for election for, was him, of course. He had the idea also of modernizing Mexico in the way that he thought Europe was, you know, and at the time, this is you know, the late 19th century, this is early stages of uh, some kinds of collectivist thinking. There you were having, you know, these, you have to have a work brigade, you have to have people asleep by a certain time. And instead of giving any kind of power or self-recognizance to the people, this guy literally told them, you have a curfew at this time, you have to be at work, you have to do this other thing. And he regulated every single moment, every single aspect of their lives. The thing that really got them upset, and I'm talking about the Mexican people that ultimately wound up with a rebellion in 1911, or their, if I remember correctly, 1911, 1912, was his constant uh, harassment of the, lo- of the people by politicizing funerals, of all things. So speaking to the Day of the Dead, the Day of the Dead is a major, major holiday, okay? It's not something you do for just, you know, three, four hours on a Sunday morning and then you stop. Poor families in Mexico would save up for two to three months, okay, literally scraping every single penny. So by the time that they actually go to their uh, funeral or go to the graves of their friends and loved ones, they would have all the best flowers, all the best food, all the best alcohol, all the best that they could possibly afford. And we're talking scrimping for months. And the reason for it was if your family members were happy with your dead family members, you'd be best blessed with peace and prosperity for the entire year, okay? So it was a worthwhile expense. So people would go there, all right, they'd get, get arrived there usually by about midnight or so when, the, when they would believe the spirits would start arriving, and they would start praying at gravesides, they'd start stringing up lanterns in the trees, you know, there'd be food vendors, you know, there'd be liquor vendors, there'd be kids running around, there'd be people dancing, there'd be music, I mean, there'd be people, you know, having sex out behind some headstones, I mean, this was a huge, like, fiesta, and sometimes this would go on for days. Now... Diaz didn't like this, okay, because, number one, um, it caused a lot of police presence, because unfortunately, if you've got a lot of people that are around and they're all drinking, what's going to happen? People are going to start fighting. So he would say, oh, I don't like this. You shouldn't have this. You guys shouldn't be out drinking all night anyway. You have work in the morning. So you know what this guy does? He goes and he shuts down the cemeteries on the Day of the Dead. You could only be in there between the hours of 10 a.m. and noon and 3 p.m. and 6 p.m. So he turned the entire festival that had been going on for centuries at this point into a five-hour affair in the name of public progress and peace. Mm. And in the mind of the people, what he had done is he had severed them from the only time that they could actually, in a sense, find and see their friends and family and loved ones, the only time they would come back on the Day of the Dead. And that horrible person, Diaz, was not going to let them see their friends again, wasn't going to let them see their family again. How dare he? So, 75 presidencies, extremely unstable government, lots of rebellions, lots of fighting, generates lots of heroes. People remember lots of people who wind up dying for causes. There are a lot of plaques you'll go to if you go uh, through plazas of Mexico, you know. So-and-so died on this very spot. What Diaz would do is he would actually go find the graves of war heroes, okay, and cultural heroes, dig them up wherever they wherever they were buried, and then transport the remains in these hugely, ridiculously expensive and lavish, lavish state funerals, okay? There's this one picture uh, in this book I was talking about where there's a cremated remains, this little tiny urn, on top of this massive, humongous uh, mound of flowers and, you know, wreaths and, you know, swaths of silk and everything. You literally couldn't see the urn. The guy had to point it out with an arrow, 
Why? Because it was a state mm. funeral, state funeral. Well, this guy keeps on co-opting the dead. He goes and he severs the people from their people or, you know, from their relatives during the Day of the Dead. And ultimately, he winds up getting thrown out, of, thrown out over it. Diaz was exiled in 1911 and he died in France, I think, four years later. But that was a tipping point. He would not stop uh, messing with their beloved dead. Is Diaz Spanish for dickhead? Because that's kind of what it sounds like here. Uh, some people try to lionize the Porfiriat, it's, or the Porfiriato is what it's referred to, because, you know, he did bring some measures of progress, some industrialization and whatnot. But a lot of people, if Mr. Diaz was buried in Mexico, I believe his grave would be well desecrated. How about that? There you go. <laughs> there you go. <sighs> so Santa Muerte then, let's give a nice little, and I know we've covered some bits and pieces of this so far, but let's give a, a nice introduction to who she is and what she represents and how you can work with her. Absolutely. Santa Muerte literally means uh, holy death in Spanish, and it refers to a Catholic folk saint who is seen as a female form of the Grim Reaper. Again, back to that bit that I mentioned that it has a bit to do with some of the um, European roots of Santa Muerte, the La Parca, and the Spanish. Santa Muerte is not an official Catholic folk. Uh, it's not an official Catholic saint. That's the first thing to remember. She could never actually become a Catholic saint. And the reason why is in about the 16th century or thereabouts, the Catholics stopped canonizing saints based on popular attribution and started acquiring that they've been living people at some point or another. Okay, so a provable living person. So since, since Santa Morte has never been conceived of as an actual living person, you rarely find that variation in people's stories about her. There is some, one variation sometimes you hear on the uh, origin of Santa Morte is that she is actually the soul of a woman who was, she fell in love with a guy, the guy spurned her, of course, so she committed suicide. And being a suicide, she couldn't go to heaven. And since she was so beautiful, and the reason why she killed herself was so, in a sense, pure, I mean, it was done for love. God took pity on her and let her collect the souls of the dead. That's one small variation you sometimes hear on the story of Santa Muerte. It's not very common, but if you do some research, you will sometimes run into it. Anyhow, so Santa Muerte is a folk saint. A folk saint is a saint that is simply just conceived of by popular attribution. The Catholic Church tolerates the cults of a lot of folk saints. There is one uh, who's one of my favorites. Her name is La Defunta Correa. That means the, the deceased Correa. It was a lady in Argentina who uh, took her infant daughter with her. Her husband had gotten conscripted. There was a war going on, and uh, she was following the army, trying to get her husband back, trying to plead with the uh, captain of the regime, you know, or captain of the regiment, I suppose. And uh, she was crossing a large desert, and she wound up dying of thirst. Uh, her body was found a couple days later by some ranchers. Her baby was still on her breast and was still suckling from her breast, which was still miraculously full. So the ranchers, the cattle hands, went and they buried her. And they told everyone about this miracle that they had seen with this baby that, you know, ever full breast uh, lived, you know, is going to live. And uh, the place wound up becoming a shrine where this lady was buried. OK, and she's considered the patron, patron saint of children and cattle drivers, truckers, people who travel, basically anyone who might die of thirst on their way. Her cult is probably about three or four hundred thousand people strong in Argentina and Brazil. And you'll often see Catholic priests uh, participating in, you know, processions dealing with her. They tolerate her along with, you know, other official saints. They're like, oh, yes, it's La de Funta Correa and St. Jude, who is official. That's totally fine, totally fine. Santa Muerte is a huge exception to this. Santa Muerte is not tolerated by the Catholic Church. They do not like her at all. The overlying reason for this is because Santa Muerte is associated with some people, frankly, are pretty violent and pretty nasty. We're talking the drug cartels. And uh, the Catholic Church already has several saints that are already dedicated to death already. So an inclusion of another saint, even if just a folk one, isn't really necessary, especially one who's got kind of an ugly reputation. The other thing about Santa Muerte is she tolerates witches and magicians just fine. Matter of fact, Santa Muerte tolerates everyone. That's what makes her kind of unusual as, as a saint, actually. Some saints will hear like, oh, you're this some kind of sinner, or you've done bad things or what have you. You can't, you know, go to the church. You can't pray to the saint. You're a bad person. Santa Muerte doesn't mind. Why? Everyone is going to die someday. And once you're dead, it becomes a zero-sum game in her mind. So if you have done something that has normally make you feel rejected from mainstream culture, say you're a violent criminal, you have a criminal history, a felon, you're an ex-murderer, an ex-armed you know, armed robber or something, no one is going to want to know you. No one is going to want to care for you. Except Santa Muerte, because she doesn't mind. She does not mind. 
So Santa Muerte doesn't mind certain witches and magicians. And since the Catholic Church is generally against the practice of witchcraft, even though, like I said earlier, it seems to practice its own form itself, Santa Muerte is likewise banned. So one thing you will find interesting is uh, the Mexican government, especially uh, bringing up Porfirio Diaz again, uh, you could not get buried, of course, in Mexico without the Catholic Church getting involved. You couldn't get married. You couldn't get, you know, certain kinds of licenses just because you weren't a good church member of the church in good standing because it was one of the pillars of government in a sense. So the Catholic Church did not like the veneration of La Muerte. You know the uh, uh, skeletal figure that is sometimes associated with Santa Muerte? It's uh, the La Catrina Posada. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. A lot of people uh, associate that with uh, Santa Muerte. That uh, figure was actually engraved by a political satiricist who was making fun of Porfirio Diaz and the upper okay. classes. <laughs> so well, I can um, see why it would be a, a good sort of representation or symbol for a folk saint venerated by the common people then. Absolutely, absolutely. So since Santa Muerte accepts foibles and, like you just said, the common people and things that you shouldn't do or whatever, she loves everyone in a sense. She's the patron saint of the Day of the Dead, the same place that you know people were thrown out of. Santa Muerte and the Catholic Church just don't have a history of getting along that cult, that cult of death. And the Catholic Church it just doesn't mesh sometimes real well. And this is a great example. So the Catholic Church uh, condemns the worship of Santa Muerte, like I said. There are a couple Catholic folk saints that are associated, or I'm sorry, Catholic saints who are associated with Santa Muerte, despite her dark reputation. St. Jude is one of them. So when the police go rolling into, Mexican police, Mexican military, go rolling into the areas where uh, drug cartels, you know, set up bases or their nests, if you would, they will start destroying shrines. They will destroy the shrines of Santa Muerte, okay, like utterly burn them to the ground. But the shrine right next to it is St. Jude that was also being used by the drug cartel they won't touch. So explain that one to me. Yeah, that's pretty interesting. Yep. (laughs) So (laughs) the book that you've written, would you call this a grimoire then? I'm not sure if I would call it a... Well, how are you defining grimoire? If it's simply a manual of how to work with one certain spirit, then absolutely, yes, it is a grimoire. Yeah, I was just thinking of a manual of, you know, how to perform magical spells and in this case it would be with this one particular spirit yes absolutely this book if you term it a grimoire is actually i think very interesting because it does not presuppose any kind of particular religious or magical belief system if you are a practicing catholic you can pick this up and do what's in the book if you are a practicing wiccan you can pick this up just like the catholic and do exactly the same thing So the book is accepting of all kinds of modes of thinking, just like Santa Muerte in a sense herself is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. I just read through it this week and learned a lot. You really sort of, I guess, inspired me to start working with her because she has such a a wide variety of uses. And that's kind of what I want to get into now. If you could tell people, you know, how to best work with her, their seven colors of Santa Muerte and their meaning. And I was just wondering if you could just tackle that part of the book for us right now. Sure, absolutely, absolutely. Well, like I said a a moment ago, you don't have to follow any kind of particular mode of belief or magical paradigm to work with Santa Muerte. Uh, One of the kinds of examples I love bringing up in my book, just because it seems so incongruent, although it's perfectly functional, is you can actually combine Norse heathenry, I'm talking rune magic, and work with Santa Muerte. And that's not something I came up with. There are two practitioners of Santa Muerte local to me who actually do that. They do that themselves. I didn't come up with it. So and it's quite effective. It sounds pretty cool, We're, too, to be honest. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I myself am, usually would build myself as a chaos magician. That is the baseline magical paradigm that I come from after my bit of a tiff with the Catholic Church when I found out I couldn't become a priest. Uh, the most <laughs> influential book I found was Peter Carroll's Libernal and Psychonaut. And yeah. that's kind of where everything took off for me. So... Um, I write the book kind of from that perspective, which is why I would like to say, anyway, that I think I'm so flexible in terms of magical paradigm, because whatever you need to believe works. <laughs> Chaos magician, after all. So working with Santa Muerte is actually a very simple thing. Since anything you do with Santa Muerte is basically considered speed, uh, spirit-mediated magic, the primary and fundamental thing you have to do is establish a good relationship with Santa Muerte, which means you have to give her attention. Now, what does attention mean? It doesn't have to be constant prayer. I just simply talk to my statue all the time. I bring her food. I refresh her water on her altar every day. 
If I'm happy with something she's done, I'll play her music. You don't have to go into these elaborate rituals with Santa Muerte. That's one thing I absolutely love about her. I don't like elaborate rituals. I think oftentimes they are too much window dressing to accomplish something. Again, that's Chaos Magician in me speaking. So anything that is simple and easy, I find extremely attractive. Working with Santa Muerte, its baseline and how I discovered working with Santa Muerte, it can be simply done as candle magic. The way I uh, found Santa Muerte, incidentally, this is a fun little story. So I was raised Catholic, got away from the Catholic Church. Here in New Mexico, uh, when you go to the grocery store or any place that sells like uh, pillar candles, uh, you will have tons and tons and tons and tons of saint candles available for sale. And I'm looking at them and it's, you know, you've got, you know, your Saint Jude, your Saint Teresa, you know, different versions of the Virgin Mary, what have you. I look down at the bottom of the shelf, the entire bottom shelf, I'm talking probably about six to eight feet of facing space. So it's a whole rack. Nothing but Santa Muerte candles. There was more shelf space hmm. dedicated to Santa Muerte than to the Virgin Mary and Jesus combined. And <laughs> I'd never heard of her. So I'm looking at them. There's white ones, black ones, and red ones. So I picked out a white one because, I don't know, took it home. And I lit it. I did a rosary because I still have my rosary from when I was a kid. And I said, Santa Muerte, I don't know who you are. Who Show yourself to me. So a couple of days later, I have a girlfriend of mine who loves going to garage sales. Every Saturday, she's always out fidgeting through other people's junk. And she calls me and she's like, I found the best box of Halloween stuff for you. I've just got to bring it by. So she comes on over and it's a big box of, you know, rubber spiders and bats and little plastic coffins and this kind of thing. And I get to the bottom of the box. There's a Santa Muerte statue on the bottom with two prayer guides written in Spanish. She had no idea what they were, didn't even know the uh, statue was in the box. That's how I got my first Santa Muerte statue, after lighting a candle and asking her to reveal herself to me. And that's how fast she works. You can go to Santa Muerte for literally anything. Absolutely anything, no matter how big, no matter how small. Let me give you an example of the big one. Uh, my brother was a commercial electrician, and he had a very big and very fancy work truck. It was a F-250 dually. It had uh, the back end was taken off. You know, it didn't have a regular truck that had like, like a box end, like you see in like electrician's truck, full of tools. And uh, he would take his tools out at night and leave his truck parked in his driveway because he just simply couldn't fit his truck in his garage. It was too big. He worked in a lot of rural areas. He had, like, you know, big tires on it so he could, you know, uh, drive off, you know, fixing billboards out in the middle of nowhere type thing. And that's what he did. So one morning he wakes up to go out to work and his truck is gone. We have a car thief problem here in Albuquerque, incidentally. If you come to Albuquerque, make sure you watch your vehicle. He calls me. He's panicking because he can't get to work. He doesn't know what to do. The cops told him, kiss your truck goodbye because it's a white Ford F-250. It's one of the most commonly stolen vehicles in the United States. You're five hours from the Mexican border. I guarantee you that thing's either already over the border or in a chop shop is literally what the cops told him. So he calls me in a panic. He doesn't know where he's going to get $50,000 out of the blue to get his new truck because, you know, his insurance is going to take weeks, if not months, to reimburse him, you know, by the time they file the police report, you know, do their paperwork. And he's got to work now. So he's telling me, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. What do I do? So I didn't know what to do either, frankly. So I told him I would try to figure something out, and I hung up the phone. And I turned to my green Santa Muerte statue, and I'm like, Santa, I don't know what the hell to do. So I decided to go down to the graveyard to do the work, because oftentimes um, I found when I need something kind of larger or more major, you know, like a truck to fall out of the sky, going to the graveyard and addressing her directly, you know, where the dead are seems to be a little more effective. So I go down to the graveyard, and I've got my rosary in one hand, and I've got some candles and a bottle of tequila in the other, and i trying to figure out where I'm going to do my ritual. Oftentimes, I'll, uh, I will do these things in the exact dead center of the graveyard, uh, or like a crossroads, um, and I got a feeling that that wasn't the right place to go do it. All right, So I'm wandering through the graveyard like an idiot, and I spy this one grave off to the one side, and I don't know why, I just seem to like that one. So I go wandering over there, take a closer look at it. Down on the ground behind that one grave, someone else had already been doing magic back there. There were drips of wax, there were seeds, there were coins, there was all kinds of stuff back there. That was a magic grave. Not mine, I don't know who's been doing work. But since apparently that particular uh, inhabitant of the grave didn't seem to mind people using it for magic, I hunkered down and lit my candle and did my thing and asked Santa to fix it all. I went around to the front of the grave and I took a picture of it because I like to, uh, when I ask a specific uh, dead person for help, I often like to go home and, you know, venerate them for a while and thank them for their help because I did just wake them up in a sense, you know. Yeah. Um, and I looked the guy up. He died recently. 
And uh, I was reading his obituary because it was still online. And uh, of all things, this guy used to be a, a commercial plumber. Okay, the exact kind of person who would be able to help a commercial electrician out of trouble. You know, you know, workman. Who else would help? So the next day, my brother gets a call from the cops. The cops are astonished. The reason why is his truck has been found less than two miles from his house in a Walmart parking lot. It still had gas in it. Nothing was busted out except the uh, where they uh, take it off part of the steering column so they could hotwire it. Hmm. It had a couple of heroin needles in it. That truck Mm. should have been long gone and never seen again. But less than two miles from his house, he walked to go pick it up. That's crazy, man. That is such a cool story. Absolutely. So that's a big thing for Santa Muerte. When I talk about small things, this just happened and this is funny. So I'm a girl. I like new clothes. I like shoes. I like that kind of thing. I'm very girly. And I'm going to be going on tour here uh, pretty soon. I'm going to be going to... uh, Mystic Journeys out in Venice Beach, California, do a book signing, for example. I'm going to be going out to Tempe, a couple local appearances, that kind of thing. And um, girly being girly, I wanted to buy some new clothes, of course, because why not? So I was looking around online, and I couldn't find what I wanted. And I turned around to my Santa Muerte statue. It was about 4 o'clock on the afternoon on a Friday. This is two weeks ago. And I say to the statue, gee, Santa, I'd really like to have a new black lace dress just to go to one of these signings in. I didn't really do anything else. The next day... I have a friend who comes by my house sometimes. He is a, he kind of has a handyman business, you know, if your sprinklers are busted, if you need to yard trim, that kind of thing, you know, hauled away trash. He was coming by to pick up some yard debris because I'd finished trimming, you know, some bushes and stuff in my backyard, getting ready for the fall time. And uh, he sends me a text message saying, oh, I left your dresses on the wall, on, the, on your courtyard wall. And I was thinking, what dresses? Okay. And he told me recently um, that he, about a year ago, he'd broken up with his wife of about 10 or 15 years. And recently he told me he'd been going through, you know, the garage and getting rid of stuff. So I kind of put together in his head that maybe his wife had some old clothes and he doesn't know any women. So maybe he gave them to me. It makes Mm. sense, right? Yeah. So I go wandering outside. And what do I find laying on my courtyard wall? I find a black lace dress and a black dress that had a um, kind of colored panel in the middle of it. It has a peacock pattern. I love peacocks. They're my favorite animal. So I send him a text. I'm like, thank you for the dresses. And he's like, what are you talking about? I found them laying in your yard. They fit, by the way. They look mm. great. <laughs> so you attribute that so, to Santa Muerte just looking out for you then, huh? Yeah, basically. I mean, that, that is literally all I did. I turned around and said, Santa, I would like these dresses. I thought of, I just like a black lace dress. What did I get? A black lace dress and one of the peacock pattern. What else can I say? So it sounds minor. It sounds silly. But you can go to her for literally anything. Stolen truck, need a new job, need a new boyfriend, can't find the cute shoes. She can fix it all. You mentioned uh, a couple colors. You mentioned white a few minutes ago, and you mentioned green during this truck story that you just told us. The different colors represent different features that she uh, works with, right? With working with Santa Muerte, there's actually two color models you'll find a reference. There is a more traditional model I just want to let your uh, listeners know about. It is only a three color model using white, red, and black. I don't use that model, and the reason why is I prefer having an expanded color system where there are seven colors available, because I think that with more differentiated colors, it's easier to aspect of, or access different aspects of her personality or her powers or her abilities. So that's why I prefer the seven-color model. So speaking of the seven-color model, like uh, the colors go from uh, white, green, red, blue, gold, and uh, purple. Purple, of course, being the last one. And uh, all these different colors was represent it, a different aspect of her personality. I was going to say, but I think you missed black, though. Wasn't black in there? Uh, I did. I think I said black. I think I said black. Yes. I hope I said black. <laughs> it's white. It's black. <laughs> right. It's red. It's green. It's blue. It's gold. And it's purple. There we go. That's all seven. So, for example, you, uh, money and uh, wealth kind of magic, and you associate it with the green one. Uh, that is where Santa Tamorte actually deviates from most common sim or systems of magic because normally you think of green wealth fertility that kind of thing hence green candles from uh, money magic that would actually be attributed to the gold function uh the green function is typically responsible for matters concerning balance and justice that's why i went to her when my brother's truck got stolen Mm. because it had been stolen by criminals the cops were not being helpful and he needed justice in getting his truck back so hence i went to the green 
Money magic, uh, interestingly enough, it works a little different. Some folks don't realize that the history of money, money itself is usually associated with gods of death and not gods of fertility and wealth. The reason why is money itself, all right, gold, silver, coinage metals, things that you exchange for the things that you need to live, like bushels of wheat and sheep, number one is useless in itself. You can't eat it. You can't build a house out of it. You can't build a weapon with it. You can't burn it for keep you warm. Okay, gold is useless. It's pretty, but useless. And number two, you can only acquire it at extreme risk to yourself. Mining is dangerous, okay? Going into the ground and taking rocks out makes the tunnels more unstable. It's dangerous to mine, especially in ancient eras, okay? So by going and taking wealth out of the ground, it was often thought that you were taking money directly from the gods of the dead. So sometimes you'll see that money and wealth actually have a kind of an inverted relationship. You think of wealth, you know, I have a nice house, you know, I have a nice car, I have a nice yard, my kids are healthy, what have you. Those are the things that money or perhaps even, I hate to say charity, is giving you. I mean, your aunt can give you a beautiful house. You can still be broke in your bank account. You see what I mean? So you can have the trappings of wealth, but no actual money. And that's sometimes something I'll find people, you know, when we talk about you know, magic or trying to troubleshoot magic, you know, you know, my money, you know, my wealth magic doesn't work. My wealth magic doesn't work. I'm broke. I'm broke. Well, you're looking for growth and physical things. You're not looking for that which gives you those things. Does that make sense? This has a kind of like an inverted relationship. So working with the gods of death, like working with Santa Muerte in particular, being the power of death is actually a very good way to generate that kind of cash and that kind of capital just so long as you understand that inverted relationship. So that's why the gold aspect of Santa Morte is actually associated with giving and granting of vitality, which is also why she's also used for healing by many people. So, because she grants life and giving golden mm-hmm. vitality because she could buy you food, buy you life, same thing. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, I was thinking too, the Santa Morte, I think a lot of people would be familiar with some of the symbols that are used to sort of portray her, particularly like a sugar skull, right? Absolutely, a calavera. Right, right. People always associate calaveras with uh, Mexico and the Day of the Dead. It is interesting um, that that is actually the colored sugar arts or the, you know, the colored icings and whatnot was actually an art that was developed in Italy and brought over in the mid 19th century or earlier, I think, actually into Mexico. And since the poor underclasses could not afford all of these elaborate religious icons, you know, all the gilt and all the fancy oil paintings and things that were brought in from Europe, they started associating or started making, they learned how to do the uh, colored icing and started making sugar skulls and things out of it to venerate their own icons and icons of the dead. So again, sugar skulls are actually a little bit of a class warfare in of themselves. Oh, okay. Well, that is a symbol, though. I've seen pop up in the last, you know, five to 10 years, just a lot throughout Western culture here. And It sort of ties in, you know, Santa Muerte herself has risen in popularity. Her cult, her followers have risen exponentially in the last couple decades as well. I was wondering what we can attribute that to. And you actually, I was thinking about it as I was reading through your book and then you touched on it. I'd like to talk about it just for a moment. This coinciding with this new aeon of rediscovering the divine feminine, which I've been reading and talking with other guests and people in my personal life about for the last couple of years, just this rise in what we would call feminine energy. Could you maybe touch on that and and how it correlates to the rise in popularity of this patron saint of death? Absolutely. Absolutely. I'd love to. Oftentimes, speaking of aeons, you will see overarching or overriding cultural trends directing the sub-beliefs of an entire culture, civilization. What I mean by that is you may have a baseline fundamental idea in patriarchy or um, the you know dominance of male energy in, in a sense, and that will generate a lot of male dominated religions, a lot of male dominated you know laws. You know women aren't allowed to own property or what you know these kinds of things, all because male is superior, just because the patriarchy or the concept of patriarchy is more dominant. Prior to that, a lot of people believe that uh, that was not the case, that their, uh, fe- that culture was tended to be more female-dominated. Okay, you know, Earth Mother Goddesses, you see a lot of the Venus and Willendorf type, fi- type figures, that kind of thing. And that it's almost like a pendulum has swung from one side, from a very feminine and Earth-oriented kind of culture, in a sense, uh, into a patriarchal mode of thinking. 
And some people think that uh, the world is now swinging out of that kind of direction of thinking and swinging back more towards a feminine ideal. Uh, one reason I think that Santa Muerte and other goddesses that are associated with death, uh, Kali, for example, I think I bring up in my book, are so popular is we look at the world around us and no matter what your personal political leanings may be, you're probably not happy with the world, okay? You're probably not happy with elected government. You're probably not happy with your job. You're not probably happy with the level of violence. You may be concerned about the degree of destruction to the environment, climate change. I mean, the constellation of things that you could feel very passionately upset that is very wrong with this world is very large. Okay, You can ask anybody. They give you a long list these days. Now, when you feel like everything is so wrong, you just want it to end. You want it to stop. You want people to stop being so mean to each other. You want people to stop thinking so poorly. You want people to stop being so violent. You just want it all to stop. And what is stopping? Death. Okay, now it doesn't literally mean everyone needs to die. We don't all need to, you know, jump off a bridge and die today. I'm not saying that. Please don't. Nobody, please do that. But Santa Muerte represents the power of cessation. It's the power of cessation of anything. Okay, so it can be the cessation of hatred. It can be the cessation of, you know, global destruction. It can be the cessation of warfare. It can be the cessation of the things that we don't like that nobody likes. So that is one of the reasons why I think Goddesses of Death and Santa Muerte in particular are becoming so popular. And one of the reasons why Santa Muerte is actually getting associated with, maybe years ago they would have become uh, considered fringe, but now perhaps they're more mainstream, like um, the uh, uh, lesbian, gay, bi, transgender community, for example. She's often considered the patron saint of that segment of society because she accepts everyone. And she's not going to say, I hate you because you're gay or I hate you because you love this other person or um, you believe you've been misgendered at birth or something like that. Does that make sense? And if you believe that what is causing the crushing pain is the rejection of that kind of idea, that it dying, at least not a concept, is incredibly appealing and incredibly attractive. And when it's brought to you by a friendly female saint who forgives you for everything you've done because she knows human foibles, she sees everything, she is death after all, why wouldn't Santa Muerte become popular? You see what I'm saying? Yeah, absolutely. It makes a lot of sense. And just to stay on the topic of death for a moment, because it is such an interesting topic to me, modern Western culture seems to view death quite negatively. But in older cultures, death is, is viewed a bit differently. How did cultures like the Aztecs, for example, and even some older European cultures, how did they view death? Uh, death is an inevitability that everyone's going to come through. Um, the Aztecs, I think I touched on this a little bit earlier, um, believed that death was an utterly necessary portion of the world and function of society because everyone, in a sense, is living on borrowed time, hence the idea of sacrifice. In earlier European cultures, it would be very, very common, and sometimes you'd actually see this in uh, more rural areas in America as well, where the dead would be welcomed, or you'd have like a wake that would last all night, okay, that the whole community would get together, and there would be, you know, understanding of the grieving, and the whole, the body would be prepared, and what have you. There's this other culture, uh, it's in the Philippines, I believe, where they actually go and dig up their dead every single year redress them, you know, wash their bodies, which of course have been decaying for a while because they've been buried for a year. And they'll stay up with them all night and treat them as if they're still alive and they'll go and they'll rebury them. And they do this every single year. Now, if you believe in the idea of some kind of eternal soul or some kind of continuity after death, the dealing with a body, it's tragic for a while. Of course, it's grief inducing. Nobody wants their loved ones to die. But it's sort of just like an incidental dealing with okay your friend is never actually gone their soul is eternal perhaps they've reincarnated however you split that kind of belief about what happens when you die so in modern american culture and this has been going on for century at least it has to do with embalming i think of all things i mean in europe it's been very common that they don't go and they do okay uh, my brother died recently and one thing that struck me as very odd when i saw his body laid out in the funeral home was they had gone to great efforts to make him look like he was alive. Okay, yeah. They put a lot of makeup on him. Um, one thing that folks don't know that they'll often do to uh, corpses to prepare them is if the uh, mouth looks too sunken, what they will actually do is they will cut out the inside of the lips. I mean, literally cut slivers of flesh outside of the inside of the lips. They will stuff the mouth with cotton, 
And then they will sew the mouth so it has like this perfectly pout looking appearance. To me, that's horrifying. Why would you cut up your grandmother's lips and stuff them with cotton? So she looks like she's more alive. It's grotesque. So you think of this kind of behavior, the way that we treat our dead. Um, we don't typically culturally um, venerate our dead in any kind of way. Okay. And granted, uh, Catholics have an, all, have an All Souls Day, which will pray for their uh, souls of the dead one day a year. But they're not uh, bringing them around. They're not, you know, having these traditions oftentimes where, you know, the dead come at midnight to come talk to people. It just doesn't happen, you know. There's another tradition that's uh, common in Mexico relating to the Day of the Dead that was practiced in um, rural Spain, if I remember correctly. It's almost like Christmas caroling in a sense. What you do is the evening of the Day of the Dead is you'll go over to your friend's house and you'll knock on the door and they answer it. And you ask them if, you, if they have any souls of the dead to give you. And they'll either say yes or no. Um, if they say yes, it's because someone died during that year. So like maybe their brother died or something. And then you'll go into that person's house. And you'll have something to eat. You'll have something to drink. You better have a good tequila tolerance because you'll be drinking a lot of it. And you'll go from house to house to house with all your friends knocking on doors, asking if anyone has any spare souls. So once you've knocked on all the doors, it's presumed that the souls are now following you around because you collected them. And everybody winds up in the graveyard to bring the souls home. You never see that kind of thing these days. The other thing that bugs me about death in American culture is the death or uh, the dead are always are very frequently seen as horrifying or terrible things. I mean, think of the uh, TV series The Walking Dead. I mean, when do you ever see a dead figure as a good figure? The movie Ghost. That was kind of a long time ago. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's always sort of treated as this terrible, horrible thing. Okay, you look at the nightly news, and you know somebody got smeared across six lanes of the interstate, and they're going, "Oh, this is terrible! This is terrible! Death is everywhere!" Ah! You never hear about the good death, okay? You never hear about the terminal cancer patient who's been metastatic bone cancer, okay? Who's in horrible pain, whose friends have all died because they're 85 years old and they're old, and they want to die too because their wife died 15 years ago. They're done. They're ready. They're happy yeah. to die. I'm a nurse. I'm a registered nurse. I worked in the emergency department. Some of these patients are very happy to go and they treat death as an old friend. And frankly, if I was in that scenario, I think she'd be pretty darn friendly too. Yeah, I think you see that a lot too, just with older couples who have been married for several decades that, you know, once one of them passes on, the next one usually follows very closely because they want to go with their partner, right? Absolutely, they do. And who would blame them? And if you think that the soul is eternal and that you go on somewhere, anywhere else, why not shed an old body? It's painful. That's arthritic. You've had three heart attacks. You've got cancer. Forget it. Let's just go and enjoy ourselves and shed the pain. There's nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with that. My way of thinking anyway. But that's never really brought up or discussed in mainstream culture. It's always, oh, zombies. Oh, this horrible thing. Oh, this person was murdered. Oh, death is terrible. Oh, yeah. look, we're going to dress up our dead and make them look like mannequins and make it all look very grotesque and freak people out. Instead of embracing our dead and understanding that death happens and understanding that we're all going to die and that it's okay. It's okay. Yeah, I've always looked at death very simply. We all have to do it, so it must be important. There's only three things you have to do in this life. You have to be born, you have to pay taxes, and you have to die. Well, I don't have to pay taxes, actually. <laughs> <laughs> but wait, that's a, we're not going to get into that conversation right now. So... Santa Muerte or Santa, I keep saying Santa, Santa Muerte is considered a Lord of the World figure. What does that mean and what other familiar figures in the occult and esoteric space are considered Lords of the World? Because I think there's a couple that people may recognize. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, what a Lord of the World figure could be seen or defined as is a dominant or overarching spiritual figure that has such power and such influence and such authority that it can be considered to be in charge of or able to affect absolutely every darn thing you can think of. Okay, everything in the world from soup to nuts, and that is why it's called the Lord of the World. Commonly uh, referenced Lord of the World figures to be like Baphomet, for example. Baphomet's often considered a Lord of the World type figure. Um, you can consider uh, powerful, very powerful death spirits as being Lord of the World type figures, such as Santa Morte. And the reason for that is uh, pretty simple. The idea of death being the second most powerful, or if, depending on how you look at it, the most powerful force in the universe, is uh, actually a very ancient one. Certain versions of uh, the Bible, early versions of the Bible, will talk about, you know, God first says, I am. And then the next thing he does is he creates death. 
And the reason why is death creates a possibility of change. It creates a vacuum into which new life has to grow, okay? Which is why death has such a incredibly powerful and commanding presence on the magical and metaphysical world and how it turns out. But yes, you could see her as a uh, Baphometic type figure. Um, another figure that is you could align her along with, um, one of my favorites because I love peacocks so much, is a figure called Melek Taz, the peacock angel. There is a certain, um, you sometimes hear about them in the news, it's a group called the Yazidis. They believe that uh, God is a very, very, very powerful figure, of course, and he creates all things and knows all things. And when he created this particular world that we live on, he decided to give complete control of it to his favorite angel, okay, the peacock angel, Melek Taz, who was so beautiful and just so glorious and gracious and just so wonderful because he was, he was a peacock. He was, he was great. So he gave control of this world that we live in now to this peacock angel. Well, the problem with the peacock angel is he's very vain and he's very short-sighted and he kind of does whatever he wants. He doesn't have God's wisdom. He doesn't have God's sense of love. He doesn't have all of these things which is why the world itself isn't necessarily such a great place. I mean, uh, you know, people get hurt. There's ugliness in the world, disease. I mean, there's no rationale behind pediatric eye cancer that I can think of, yet it exists. You know what I mean? And that's why the world is the way it is. So if you want anything handled or changed or fixed, you don't appeal to God. God's not in charge. Melek Taz is, because he's the lord of the world. So since death is a force that can touch literally everything, okay, anything that can decay, anything that can change, and certainly anything that can die, which is everything, death itself can affect. And since Santa Morte is that power embodied, she is the lord of the world and can be appealed to for anything, from finding stolen trucks to having dresses fall out of the sky. Yeah, absolutely. And I just wanted to throw that in there because it was one of the more interesting correlations you know you hear a lot about baphomet for example in the occult and it's always spun in a very negative way so to see baphomet mentioned in your book in that way was sort of refreshing you know <laughs> i find baphomet a very very interesting figure a fusion of male and female principles to create manifestation upon this world i don't really see how that can be seen as a bad figure in my sense it's just sort of been uh i guess you would call it demonized in the you know conspiratorial community the conspiracy theorists the people who see the occult as dangerous and also the people who see the elite wealthy class now that's in charge i guess they see them as baphomet worshipers so they automatically equate the figure itself to being this evil negative figure I would tend to agree with that perspective of Baphomet, absolutely. Um, I personally think that's a, a bad way of looking at Baphomet because it implies that the only pure and perfect is to escape this world and get out of it and away from the sin and corruption and become, I don't know, more elevated. And I think we're in this world for a reason and we ought to enjoy ourselves. There you go. And I think that's a great note to wrap up on, Tracy. Please do tell people where they can find you and where they can find your book. My book is available, of course, on Amazon.com as well as BarnesandNoble.com. You can also order it directly at your local independent booksellers or through indie books. Um, you'll be able to find it at your local stores, such as, you know, like I said, Barnes & Noble or your local occult shop. In regards to where exactly you will be finding me, I will be doing several appearances here shortly. Uh, there is a actual listing if you go to my Amazon page, to the Tracy Rollin author page. There's a uh, upcoming events, but just to give uh, some folks some ideas, um, I will be at Bookworks over on October 4th uh, in Albuquerque, New Mexico. And I will be at the Mystic Journey Bookstore in Venice, California on October 21st out in L.A. And I'm still looking at when I'm going to be in Tempe, but as soon as I have that information, I will be posting it to my author page on Amazon, as well as to my website, which I'll be updating probably this afternoon. My website is tracyrollin.com. That is T-R-A-C-E-Y-R-O-L-L-I-N.com. The book, again, is Santa Muerte, The History, Rituals, and Magic of Our Lady of the Holy Death. Tracy, thanks so much for being here. Oh, and thank you so much for inviting me. It's very exciting. Thank you so much. <laughs> and there you have it. My thanks again to Tracy Rollin. And my thanks to Santa Muerte for her guidance. What a start to trap or treat to death veneration, Aztec and Mexican folk magic and folklore, Catholic occultism, the divine feminine. Loved this chat. Love those topics. 
Tracy's book actually inspired me to look more into Aztec witchcraft, which I'd love to explore more on this show. And she also inspired me to start working with Santa Muerte, which, you know, I think I plan on doing here soon. It seems like an easy, accessible entry point into a magical practice. And who better to work with than the rebel folk saint of death herself, who the Catholic Church refuses to recognize? Sounds like my kind of saint. Hey, if you liked what you heard and you want to contribute to this Halloween dance party, please do consider supporting the show in whatever way you can. Hit the subscribe button in your favorite podcast app. Leave the show a five-star review on iTunes if you're listening through an Apple device. Or donate some spare change to help make this show better by visiting oculturepodcast.com slash support and choosing one of our three donation options. I've also had some people recently contribute original music to the show. So if you're a musician and you got something you think I dig, send it my way, oculturepodcast at gmail.com. However you can contribute, five-star review, five-dollar donation. It's all appreciated. But for right now, I gotta get out of here. Until next time, you've just been initiated into Oculture. I am Ryan Peverly reminding you to love yourself, think for yourself, and question... Christ, who are you?